Welcome everyone. We really appreciate you joining us this morning. I'm Mary Lawler. And I have the privilege of introducing our panelists today. Um, this webinar is the second in a series that the AOTF is, um, are, is running to um, support the research community during COVID. And it's a series entitled Navigating Research During um, the Pandemic. And today we want to focus on the experiences of frontline workers and what they have to share from their experience, it might inform um, the research community about future research needs, as well as um, thinking about um, from their experiences, what kinds of ways that the research community could continue to support both the frontline clinicians, as well as um, survivors of COVID, particularly those that are having um, long-term effects and new emerging needs to support for support from the OT community. I've had the um, opportunity to talk to each of the panelists about what they plan to share today. And I have been both very excited and very impressed. So I'm sure you'll join me in, in welcoming them. Um, I'll begin by introducing our first panelist in a moment. I did wanna ask everyone to think about your questions each of the speakers will speak between 10 and 15 minutes, and then we'll have a group discussion. Um, so as you think of things that you would like to ask the panelists, if you could put them in the chat, and I will monitor the chat and, and moderate that when we get to the open discussion session. So I'd also like to, before I begin, thank Kristen Bukowski, who's the communication director at AOTF, who's been helping to put this together and is helping um, us manage the technology. Um, and also Scott Campbell, who's the um, CEO of AOTF, as well as um, MJ Mulcahy, who's the new chair of the board of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation. And I'd also like to um, thank Ilan from Bellevue Hospital, who participated in helping us um, with the speakers. So thanks to all of you, and I look forward to a great discussion. And it gives me a pleasure to introduce Rachel Flaherty, who will be our first presenter. And Rachel is, um, sorry, I'm at, um, sorry, Rachel, your, your title slide just disappeared. Sorry, I have it here. Um, Rachel is Assistant Supervisor of Occupational Therapy at Bellevue Hospital Center in New York. So thank you. And thank you, Rachel, for contributing your time and expertise today. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning to everyone. On behalf of the Occupational Therapy Department at Bellevue Hospital, I want to thank AOTF for inviting us to participate in this webinar. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure. And I hope we can add our experiences with the COVID-19 pandemic in discussing management of patients in acute care, which I will be focusing on. And Charlene, my colleague, will be discussing from an inpatient rehab perspective later on in the talk. Um, some of the themes I'll be highlighting in my portion of the presentation is how adaptability played a significant role in developing our standards of care and treating this population in an otherwise uh, change in circumstance. And while I was heavily involved with the development process, I want to acknowledge the director of our department, Ilan Lim, as well as our supervisor of acute care, Wendy Lee, for their part, um, who both really played a big role in this process. Um, just to give you sort of a uh, background and to set the tone of our facility, uh, Bellevue Hospital Center is in Manhattan in New York. Uh, we are, we have an ad uh, academic affiliation with the NYU School of Medicine, and we are the oldest operating hospital established in 1736, part of a large public hospital system, which is the New York City Health and Hospital System. We also have um, a large undocumented under uninsured homeless population as we are a public hospital. So I do hope to highlight some of the challenges being in a public hospital as well as working with this population under pandemic circumstances. 
New York City had become the epicenter, epicenter of the pandemic with over 168,000 of the 1.1 million cases nationwide as of early May 2020. Uh, the figure on this slide provides a snapshot of the phases that I'll talk about and what steps we took during each of the individual phases. And during the peak, the hospitals of the NYU School of Medicine to which Bellevue Hospital falls into, um, we had cared for more than 5,000 hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And within the hospital system, each hospital encountered their own unique challenges based on resources, uh, patient population with under this group, Bellevue fell under the only public hospital in that, in that particular group. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, the OT acute care department evaluated and treated nearly uh, 200 COVID-19 patients. So in that beginning phase of the, the hour you see there. At the start of the pandemic, we were not initially seeing COVID patients, but we knew it was going to be on the horizon. So we did try to use that opportunity to develop a standard of care. Because it was so early in the pandemic, there was not so much out there in terms of rehabilitative management of these patients. Uh, and I'm sorry, is my screen not share, shared with everyone? No. Okay, sorry about that. Now, are we okay now? Okay. You could expand it. Sorry about that. Um, so as I was saying, because it was so early in the pandemic, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to start again. Very sorry, the pandemic, we were not initially seeing COVID patients, but we knew it was going to be on the horizon. And this is when we took the time to develop the standard of care. Uh, because it, it was so early, there was not so much out there in terms of rehabilitative management of the patients. And the country, country was quite in a crisis and life-saving mode. So we were using a lot of the papers and research coming out of China, overseas. Uh, the AOTA uh, COVID-19 webinar series was also integral in developing our standards, which was uh, very helpful. And I wanna give a shout out to Jamie Wilcox, who's also a speaker today and her colleagues at USC who were really involved in those first two webinars. And we found that to be very helpful to our process and to see that we were on the right track with what we were trying to do. In terms of developing standard of care, some pragmatics, um, safety was our priority. This was a new diagnosis. We were coming from a, a viewpoint of minimizing exposure and PPE use. Um, we wanted to support the staff in uh, developing our treatment plans through co treat and lots of emotional support as this was a very stressful time for everybody. Um, we also wanted to contribute to the hospital discharge through a triage process, which I will uh, discuss in detail in the next slide. And um, as I was mentioning, the adaptability of changing circumstances is that things were changing so frequently that we wanted to make sure that we were um, on top of what we were doing and uh, adjusting as needed. So sort of our first phase of development of our protocol was uh, at the start of the pandemic where we were trying to triage orders and treatments based on the potential of change for the patient, as well as what their prior level of functioning was. Um, at the height of the pandemic, we were really focusing on patients that we could get home, that we could discharge from the hospital, and as a result, free up beds, which was a big priority for the hospital system in general. I had mentioned we were trying to minimize exposure, so trying to address that initiating treatment uh, with a telephone call so that we were not going into the patient's room physically in the beginning, but trying to get as much as information as we can to obtain a uh, prior level of functioning, developing an occupational profile, and triage based on outcome. Some of the assessments that we used were the AMPAC self-care mobility and cognition section the Lawton IEDL, as well as the HADS, as we knew that um, a lot of mental health issues were going to come out of this pandemic. And from there, the, the traditional OT evaluation would be conducted. Um, we wanted to develop a standard guide for the therapist in intervention decision-making. 
And so part of this intervention decision making was uh, their home program. And in those home programs, we would address condition, conditioning, breathing exercises, as well as um, anxiety, psychosocial issues. And we used a resource developed by an organization here in the city called New York City Well. We were not initially treating in the ICU right away in the beginning of the peak of the pandemic. Um, the logistics of having another service in an otherwise very packed ICU with patients, providers, and the hospital system in general was still learning as an institution how we were handling the um, development of how patients were moved through the different phases from a structural perspective. Um, we were also not involved, both OT and PT, with proning as they were our designated staff for this. So PCTs, other repurposed uh, medical staff were, were the ones who were actually doing proning. The population that we targeted were uh, is a collab in collaboration with our critical care attendings. Um, some of the patients we saw were the ones who were on minimal to no sedation. They were coming off the trach or vent, um, ready for the medical floors, leaving the ICU, but maybe they're still on the vent, lower sedation, but chronically ill. And patients who may or may have not had an oxygenation therapy requirement, but they had a prolonged ICU stay. And just anecdotally, patients were either very sick, nearly dying, or on the other end of the spectrum, there was like kind of nowhere in between. So this was a group of patients that we were focusing on. We did have a team of um, COVID ICU occupational therapists and under the guidance of our director and myself. And our initial approach was using different various resources and treatment options. So from a diagnostic perspective, we were looking at critical illness, pulmonary and cardiac disease, as well as um, drawing from critical care and pulmonary rehab. Some of the evaluation and treatment perspectives um, that I want to highlight that you can see sort of on your right side of the screen um, came after working several COVID ICU patients. So using activities of daily living as occupations as a means with progression of the activity based on the patient's tolerance. Um, upper extremity evaluation is always part of our ICU evaluation. However, some of the things that, that kind of struck out with this population were overlying conditionings, a condition such as plexopathy, um, overlying neurological conditions. There was a large population of um, COVID and stroke, critical illness, polyneuropathy, as well as the um, general appearance of the upper extremity. So we saw a lot of um, muscle wasting, some with cyanotic limbs, and we also considered a lot of the upper, upper part of the body. So the neck range of mo motion, um, if there were any atrophy, where were we seeing it? We would also be looking at the breathing aspects of the patient, um, both on the structural level, level, as well as their breathing patterns, which we wouldn't otherwise be paying so close, close attention to. We also try to look at the psychosocial and anxiety um, components of the patient, which Arlene will talk about in a little bit more detail, but we tried to incorporate that aspect as much as we can as an ICE, being in the ICU in general and you know, in a, a pandemic situation can be a very isolating experience. So what could we, what questions could we ask to um, assist the patient in this level? And finally, we would do our kind of traditional ICU evaluations addressing delirium cognition, vision and positioning. So kind of looking at where we are now, um, we've evolved with similar elements, but now we have a more streamlined protocol of working with these patients now that we've had now a year of, of um, experience. So we're still triaging and um, have a decision pathway based on the severity of impairment. And one of the things that have has changed in terms of people, patient population and the way that things have been regressing are the added element of these COVID positive but asymptomatic patients to now which we are making a distinction between COVID positive plus or minus the symptoms. And um, this had impacted the way that we do discharge planning because here in New York, if you have a COVID 
positive test, regardless of the symptoms, it is difficult for placement and you do need to have um, consecutive COVID negative tests to go to a next level of care. I did want to highlight some of the challenges about uh, undocumented under an uninsured population that might be kind of unique to COVID-19. A few studies which I have listed in my references have come out in the past several months showing how the health systems in New York City are uniquely positioned to contribute to this portrait of high volume of cases of minority ethnic groups and racial groups. And they are susceptible to infections with complications of COVID-19. Um, this population makes up a large portion of our undocumented uninsured population. So it's something to note. Some of the challenges that we would be having to address are places to self-isolate. Many are um, homeless. They might have multiple family members in one home and sometimes in one room. Another component that um, is particularly challenging is the aspect of health lit literacy as well as maintenance with respect to transition of care and follow-up and understanding the impact of virus on their everyday life. And to kind of summarize and wrap up some of the elements that we had been seeing and some of the trends during the past year are what are some future directions based on our experience? Um, there could be on a view of the clinician as well as patient population, which I will discuss next. With respect to um, safety and limiting exposures, efficiency of triaging orders and to support in order to support hospital discharges. And that's something that we were trying to refine our process throughout this year is what can we do to um, clear beds and get patients home. So how would, how would our efficiency look like? Because we were in a pandemic, how we did with in terms of effective crisis communication to promote resilience within our own department. Um, it was a very stressful time for all. So were we doing enough to make sure that we were communicating with our staff and also um, trickling down information from coming from above? And because COVID-19 was a novel diagnosis, what had been contributing to our successful discharges and what are some of the innovations in care delivery with respect to COVID-19? From the patient perspective, we can kind of look at it from different parts of the domain and process of our profession. So within the client factors, context, and as well as information. Um, one thing that I want to point out about the upper limb impairment, there were a number of um, kind of dual diagnosis of CVA and um, COVID-19, and which could be a whole topic in and of itself. Um, I want to give some recognition to Siobhan Walsh and um, Grace Kim, who's leading the effort of myself and three other New York City area OTs who collaborated recently to submit a manuscript that's currently in review for, the, for this topic of uh, COVID and CVA to the Annals of Occupational Therapy. So there might be more on that coming in the future, which is exciting. With respect to other client factors, um, executive dysfunction and re return to work following COVID-19, um, this might be the time period where people are recovering and now they're um, finally well enough to be able to return to their previous occupations and what that might look like in terms of executive dysfunction. An expansion of cardiopalm rehab as part of an occupational therapy program. Um, here at Bellevue, it is part of our, um, of our department. However, it is not as well developed as our other areas that we have done. And, and in terms of COVID-19, cardiopalm rehab became very important to us and what could we do to expand that program for this unique population. And I had um, kind of discussed this briefly about the implications for our undocumented and uninsured uh, and homeless population. What are some of the factors that impact aftercare following COVID-19, what their functional outcomes would be, and then what are the challenges for addressing health literacy and health maintenance for this, this population? 
And with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, participating in this talk. And I hope that some of our experiences with our acute care population um, have been helpful. Thanks so much, Rachel. And I'd now like to introduce Dr. Pamela Roberts, who's the executive director to the office of the chief medical officer, executive director and professor for the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, um, co-director of the Division of Informatics, Department of Biomedical Sciences, and associate director of uh, Informatics Fellowship at Senior Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. So please join me in welcoming Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, AOTF, for the opportunity to share um, some of our experiences here in Los Angeles. So a little bit about the institution um, that I work at. And so it's a nonprofit healthcare organization that serves Los Angeles. And of interest, it started in uh, 1902 as 12 beds. We're now um, um, a system that serves over 1 million people each year in 40 different locations. For this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the main academic medical center and our community hospital. And our academic medical center is 886 beds and our community hospital is 133 beds. And why that's of significance is we've been um, functioning at about 1,100 beds in just the academic medical center throughout this entire pandemic. So we're functioning in areas that we've never treated before. We've had areas that have become ICUs um, to be able to deal with the complicated uh, patients that we've, been, we've had. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the rehabilitation services. And I really wanna focus on some of the significant gaps in knowledge and understanding the functional limitations in the COVID-19 patients and the role of rehabilitation as has been just talked about in the New York market and some of the diverse populations within Los Angeles. Just to put some perspective on this, and I had mentioned that we've been running about 1,100 beds ever since very early on in the pandemic, but this is a kind of our uh, cumulative um, issue of confirmed patients. We've had the most, some of the most complicated patients within Los Angeles, within our community hospital. We've also had to move some of the patients from the community hospital to the academic medical center because of the complexity. But um, this was as of a couple of days ago, we've had over 3000 confirmed patients that we've been caring for just at the main medical center. So early on, we decided to try to um, quantify what was going on. So I actually did a research study that has been recently published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And it was really to start to understand the functional limitations in this population that were admitted to acute care hospitals and to look at um, what their functional limitations were by demographics, medical and encounter variables, and to understand um, where were these people going and are we prepared in the system to be able to take care of them? So I looked at a cross-sectional retrospective study and we, I used two hospitals. I used both Cedar sinai the Academic Medical Center and Marina Del Rey, which is our community hospital. This was in the first four months and we actually had the first documented case in January um, of 2020. So we, this looked at 273 uh, different records. The inclusion criteria were um, people that are 18 years or older with a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19. And we used ICD-10 codes, which has changed over the time. And we also made sure that they had a positive COVID test um, in the lab. We ended up having 230 patients. We excluded 43 patients who expired before leaving the hospitals. We were able, um, our IT department from very early on uh, developed something called, we call it Pop Disco, but it's actually the COVID-19 population discovery application. And this is based on a Caboodle database that sits over the EPIC databases, which was used and still used to be able to pull our data. I, um, with some of my work in informatics, I've been able to pair with some of the analysts to be able to pull the data very early on from the two different hospitals. So I looked at demographic variables, I looked at encounter variables such as hospital length of stay, if they had an ICU stay or not. And I also looked 
at uh, the usage of therapy and where it had occurred. I also looked at functional variables and we had to classify them into physical health, mental health, and sensory function. And then we also looked at medical variables and in particular comorbidities. And within the uh, uh, population disco, or pop disco as we call it a uh, database, we were able to um, get the Alex Hauser index. So it was able to do that. And then we were really focused on where are these people going? Are they going home? with or without home, um, home health services, or are they going to an institution, whether an inpatient rehab, skilled nursing, um, LTAC, or any other type of facility, so that we could help work within our community for what um, are needed at different levels. And this is maybe hard, but you can also look at it in the article to see, but I wanna just highlight a couple issues. So in the columns, we have those that were discharged home versus those that were discharged to an institution. And in those that were discharged home, I just want to know, note the difference in age. Those who were di discharged to an institution were much older, 75.77 years versus 56 years for those that were discharged home. Um, of note, we, more people that went home were non-Hispanic. Uh, length of stay was much longer for those that went to institution, uh, 15 days versus 7.6 days. Therapy provided, um, those that tended to go home a lot did not get therapy. And again, this was very early on in the pandemic. And then the Alex Hauser index was much higher um, for those that went to an institution. And then we did um, a subset and we looked at, and we controlled for age and we controlled for comorbidities. And hopefully I can get to the next slide. And when we, we, when we were able to, oops, did I miss a slide? Sorry. When we can, were able to control um, for comorbidities, one of the things that um, we found is those that, were um, married were more likely to go home versus those that um, were not. And, and the length of stay was much different for those that went to an institution. And of note, those that had the longer length of stay tended to have an ICU stay. And then we looked at in the subset of when we controlled for age and comorbidity, we looked at functional deficits versus physical health, mental health, and sensory functioning. And there was really a difference. Those that had uh, physical functioning tend to go to an institution as well as uh, mental health and sensory functioning. And of note, if there was a trend, it wasn't significant, but occupational therapy tended to see more of those patients that went to an institution. So some of the limitations of the study, it was one healthcare system. It was done very early on in the pandemic. We had a small grouping when we um, controlled for age and comorbidity. It was very early on in the pandemic. And at that point, there was limited use of rehab specialists. And it was likely that people were more focused on just the um, patient's medical issues and safety and how to treat them and really not identifying their functional deficits, psychological deficits or others. So it's a question if they were documented. And then on our initial sample, 19.5% were from assisted living or SNF, and we did not know what their um, functional status was um, prior. So conclusions, um, functional status is a strong predictor of discharge destination. So we need to be thinking about what happens in the whole healthcare continuum. Patients who are older and they, and they stayed longer and had more comorbidities, for those that went to an institution, probably not surprising. Rehab did play a significant aspect and will continue as they're calling them nowadays, the long haulers. We need to be thinking about what we're doing with those within the healthcare system to get them as functional as possible. We need to continue to increase our rehabilitation presence in this population. And then the challenge is adjusting to the roles of providers and healthcare systems. As the pandemic has changed, I think that Rehabilitation has become much stronger as they've um, moved off of just not looking at their medical status, but what happens to these people. So some of the 
Next steps are really to look more closely at the timing of when we actually intervene in you know, mobility, activities of day living, cognition, social functioning, psychological variables, et cetera, and help to look at what type of resources are needed for discharge destination and making sure that we have a continuum that can treat these people through the recovery, whether it's in an institution or out in the community. And then really being able to optimize our ability to respond to challenges and determine the optimal timing and the dosage of rehabilitation. I'm gonna pivot um, to another aspect that we have um, been focusing on in California, and it's really the ad adaptation for the rehab professionals and the patients. So we have implemented or in the process of implementing something called a battle body peer support system to help promote resilience and mental well-being of healthcare workers. So the rationale for this was really about burnout and that it can be a critical problem that more than 50% of healthcare providers um, had measurable impacts on the healthcare organizations with turnover and loss of revenue, that more studies really need to be looking at the physical suffering and death that has happened and how healthcare workers are adjusting to this. In a study of psychological factors of SARS in 2003 that happened in Hong Kong, that specific stressors with the highest impact were fear of becoming infected, fear of infecting others and um, of their loved ones, and fear of inadequacy. And expert, experts believe that the balance of an individual's physiologic, cognitive, emotional, and interpersonal responses to stressful situations can determine whether he or she can remain well and avoid burnout. So the potential solution was to look at a peer support model. And that's one of the things we've been doing in the physician groups, as well as in rehabilitation. This was actually a very recent article that came out that is really stating that um, healthcare burnout is predicted to worsen over the next couple of years. So we, even though the pandemic may be um, starting to get better, but the burnout is still there and it's still real. So this uh, battle buddy program was developed as part of the US Army as a peer support model to really foster resilience for those who are expected to have some type of trauma. The University of Minnesota published their Battle um, Buddy program with healthcare workers in April of 2002. And there was really three different levels of support. One was peer support, two was at the unit level, and three was individual support. So what our current plan is, we're actually in the process of rolling this out within our physical medicine and rehabilitation department. And it's gonna be voluntary, although we're gonna opt everybody in and so they can opt out if they choose to. And we're, what you do is you pair the pm &R staff using a random number generator and get, they have a buddy. And the idea is that the buddy contacts each other two or three times per week and they can be doing text, phone or video chat. The buddies listen, they validate, they provide feedback about their experiences to help foster that resilience. The buddies can anticipate stressors, to, describe plans to help respond. And the idea is stress inoculation. And either the buddy is starting to feel overwhelmed, they can escalate to a peer support program, or we use um, uh, Empathia for other resources within our healthcare system. And then we'll be measuring um, how this works using the professional fulfillment index, brief resilience scale, and then we're also gonna be doing focus groups. So we're right now doing all the education and getting ready to kick off in early March. So we hope to be able to look at and have resilience within our staff. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Pam. And I'd encourage people to um, start thinking of your questions for the panelists and to drop them in the chat and we'll be ready to go when we hit the discussion period. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Jamie Wilcox, who's Assistant Professor of Clinical Occupational Therapy at the Chan Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at Keck Medical Center here at USC. Thank you, Jamie. Hello, just give me a second here. Um, Q 
cute dogs. Mm. Okay. Oops. I'm just trying to see how, how it'll let me do two things at once here. Okay, can you guys see the slides all right? Yes, thanks. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, hi, my name is Jamie Wilcox. I am an assistant professor of um, occupational therapy at the USC Chan Division in Southern California. Um, and my primary role in the clinical faculty at USC is caring for patients at Keck Medical Center. Um, a private tertiary quaternary academic medical center uh, just located outside of Los Angeles downtown. As a member of the clinical faculty, I have had the opportunity over, over my career to uh, develop a really specialized um, practice area. And I've, over the course of my career, I've focused on taking care of patients with severe acute and chronic lung disease uh, requiring pulmonary, pulmonary transplant sometimes. Um, additionally, working with patients suffering from severe critical illness and multi-organ failure. I work across the care continuum of our medical system, and um, I will touch a bit on that today, touch a bit about that today. Um, but in a single day, I can treat patients in our outpatient hospital-based rehab clinic, our acute care units, and our critical care units. Uh, so around March 15th of 2020, I was asked by our directors to co-lead our inpatient COVID OT team with my colleague, John Margettis. And together we came really early on in the pandemic, came together and put together some metrics that we would be using for these patients. Um, we collaborated, he works in neurocritical care. I was in pulmonary critical care. So we kind of blended our, our knowledge and we trained a few of our colleagues. So we built a team of four primary therapists and three backup clinicians to care for our inpatient COVID population. Um, a really strong foundational network of interprofessional relationships um, is really what led to our success positioning occupational therapy um, as an essential provider within the COVID care continuum within our health system. Um, and I will touch a little bit about that as we move through the talk today. Um, so COVID care now, um, these are the different elements that I'm working in them. Uh, ICU critical care units, the med surge telemetry floors, we're treating them in our outpatient clinics and telehealth, uh, through telehealth um, following a COVID infection. And we're seeing patients in a specialty care center called the COVID recovery clinic, which is an interprofessional model of care. And one point I want everybody to take away from this talk today is something that I've learned to appreciate um, over the last few months is COVID-19 is really affecting two distinct cohorts of the population right now. We've got these, what they're called long haulers. And this is, these are patients that were um, contracted COVID and probably had a mild acute illness symptom course. They weren't hospitalized necessarily. They didn't require, you know, supplemental oxygen or any sort of, um, you know, supportive medications that we're hearing about. Um, they're calling themselves the long haulers and they really built this network of international patients that were going through these very diverse symptoms um, and they connected online. And this is what you're reading about in the newspapers, you're seeing um, connection, social media connection groups and they're really figuring this out with their care providers and really partnering in their care. Um, and patients are dealing with these persistent sequelae um, symptoms from the initial COVID-19 infection for um, symptoms have been tracked for greater than seven months. Um, and you're often seeing symptoms peak around two months after the initial viral infection. There's this second group of patients that we heard, we focused on really early in the pandemic, which is this COVID-19 group of patients that had critical illness requiring hospitalization. They had respiratory failure, multi-organ system involvement. They were hospitalized in intensive care. And those patients that are surviving this critical illness course are now facing what we call post-intensive care syndrome or the post-COVID recovery from a really intensive hospitalization, um, having survived some of these interventions that unfortunately 
um, sedates you, puts you on ventilators, and forces you to um, go through a process of um, systemic deconditioning. So those are our two buckets that we'll kind of touch on today. So to um, focus on this group first. So the COVID-19 pandemic really illuminated the work of OTs working in acute hospitals and critical care units. Um, early in early critical care rehabilitation is both in COVID and before COVID is really a science and an art. And it's a level of care that really captures the biopsychosocial and environmental nature that OT occupational therapy lenses bring to a very strict medical model of care. Although the room in this picture may look daunting from the outside, um, it's one of my favorite daily challenges is building opportunities for my patients in that bed to play, uh, to self-care and to connect with their loved ones uh, within the restrictions of lines and devices that enter their body and support their vital organ function. Um, as a valued member of our interprofessional care team, occupational therapy has always been embraced by physician, physician colleagues to participate in care of critically ill patients and it's been documented in the literature that um, rehab is necessary for patients with critical illness. Unfortunately, original research investigating active OT interventions is sparse and typically not published by OT practitioners. Our profession has largely relied on interprofessional colleagues to investigate and publish evidence supporting our interventions in this realm of practice. And existing research focuses on just primary physical rehab interventions and fails to capture the full scope and distinct value of occupational therapy. Current best practice guidelines for ICU care is based on the ICU liberation study by Devlin and colleagues published in 2018. And these guidelines support interprofessional models of care focused around six main bundle elements called the A through F bundle. And practice improvements in each element of the bundle leads to improved long-term outcomes by reducing the burden of this post-intensive care syndrome for the survivors of critical illness. Although associated, although we are often associated with the element on, of early mobilization, um, OT has the potential to impact every element of care in a distinct way when it's done well and coordinated with, with a team. Um, and that includes delirium prevention and management, decreasing time on a ventilator, minimizing sedating medications, and really, most importantly, right now, family engagement. Um, so let me show you a little bit about what this looks like in, um, in COVID. So this is Officer Mack, and he was admitted to COVID with COVID-19 on March 15, 2020. And on day 11 um, of his ICU stay, the officer's vitals started to stabilize and allowed us to start to turn off the paralytic Slow, uh, slow down his sedation medications and let him wake up and begin his rehab process. So the first few weeks with the officer and I had a morning routine. I would enter his room playing his favorite music uh, with a warm washcloth, wash his hands and face, slowly sitting him up in the bed in an upright position, getting him warmed up with his extremities as we um, reoriented and talked about the agenda for the day, or I talked to him about the agenda of the day. Um, Later on, our PT colleague would join us and we would work on sitting at the edge of the bed and FaceTime with his lovely wife and his Fred the dog, family dog. Um, and over the course of weeks, um, he was with us for 44 days in the intensive care unit. We worked to get him off a ventilator, use a speaking valve and engage in postural strengthening, get his voice back so he could communicate with his wife while we sat at the edge of the bed on FaceTime. And we helped him feel safe during fluctuating bouts of delirium as we worked to get him out of bed to a chair for the first time, which you can see in the picture on the slide. Um, five days out of his COVID unit, um, he was moved to the regular units after his infection. And we got him outside on a field trip to reunite with his family for the first time. Unfortunately, he was discharged not to home, but to a long-term care hospital uh, to continue his recovery. And we really didn't know what would happen to the officer. So this is a happy news because we need to celebrate our wins. Um, 102 days after he discharged to a long-term acute care hospital, we ran into, this is my colleague, John. Uh, we ran into the officer on the second floor radiology department getting a swallow study. And when I called him last night to get permission to use these photos, uh, hearing his voice on the other end of the phone, he's only still dealing with a minor balance deficit and is really back to his daily life. Um, 
at home with his wife. So a really great outcome and um, a case example of why early intervention and a tailored approach to his care made a difference applying these AF bundle characteristics early on in the pandemic. So from a critic, as a critical care OT, I am asking the research community, um, we need original OT research to demonstrate our distinct value across the different elements of critical care interventions, not just physical rehab, but cognitive, um, psychological, uh, psychosocial interventions. There's um, so much opportunity to demonstrate our value and to show what our value is distinct of other rehab professionals in this setting, um, because relying on other um, providers to demonstrate our impact of our interventions won't work forever. Um, so as we built our program in the inpatient hospital over the last year, one area that our department really helped cover because respiratory therapy was spread very thin uh, was functional activity desaturation assessments. So as patients weaned off oxygen, um, we were had them up moving and doing daily routines, building pacing and endurance activities. We needed to figure out how much oxygen they needed to get home. And we really participated with the physicians in weaning um, oxygen within the context of daily life, um, which is very fundamental to how much somebody needs based on what they're doing. We also helped guide daily activity routines with nursing care um, by giving very specific activity prescriptions, just like you would give medication prescriptions, but these are the things you're going to do and this is how you're going to do them to maintain safety in your physio physiological reserve. As patients transitioned to home, we realized they weren't getting any coaching though on how to continue weaning their oxygen or how to return back to normal life because it's not a zero to a hundred jump. You've got to take it a slow graded approach to getting back to daily life. So um, we were able to pivot to follow up in outpatient clinical care via telehealth. Um, so this picture is a screenshot of one of my early telehealth sessions with a patient that had been in the hospital in the critical care unit. And we started doing telehealth therapy um, and figuring out how to do a desaturation assessment remotely and help them wean off their oxygen. And this is a patient showing us for the first time um, off oxygen with stable saturations after doing an exertion test. It was also the first time we got, she got to see my face for the first time after no PPE was, you know, no PPE on. And it was the first time I got to see her fresh and with her makeup on and not coming out of the ICU, which doesn't look good on, it never, you never look like yourself. So um, this has been a really great way to work on continuity of care and help patients recover from this um, really overwhelming psychologically, emotionally, and physically, um, these critical illness courses. So to, pivot now to looking at the long haulers or that other that other bucket of co that cohort of patients that had mild acute illness but now are dealing with these long residual symptoms that sometimes last up to seven months. There's a study that has not yet been peer-reviewed and it's pre-press but I want to bring everybody's attention to it because I think it will really help in looking at how our interventions can target the long sequelae of COVID-19 infections. This is a patient-driven study. It has um, it was a web-based survey, and they sent it out to patients. Uh, three thousand seven hundred. Uh, I had the end up here. There over three thousand seven hundred. I think eighty-two patients completed the survey, and analysis was conducted in December twenty twenty. And these are the top eleven ranked symptoms, um, with the average patients having between seven and nine symptoms. Um, in the long haul group. Um, and each one of these symptoms are very, I think, foundational to um, what we do in, in an outpatient practice realm. And a lot of these patients are dealing with um, fluctuations in symptoms. So a few good weeks and then a relapse. And 86% of the patients experiencing relapses are saying that they're triggered by exercise, physical or mental strenuous activity or stress it's causing huge impact on return to habits, roles and routines for these long haulers. Um, and it is really impacting return to work um, and modified work schedule demands. We're seeing a lot of these patients through our COVID recovery clinic and we're seeing them in an outpatient clinic basis and on a telehealth um, plan of care, um, depending on what their needs are. If it's a more endurance-based need, we're seeing them in clinic. If it's more um, the symptoms you see up here on the list, um, we're seeing them on a telehealth-based platform working on 
um, more of a lifestyle redesign um, intervention. And it's the COVID recovery clinic is interprofessional. Um, it's we're receiving, we're receiving referrals on just about every patient that's being seen by the interprofessional team. Um, and we're really helping these long hauler patients be able to return to work, um, find balance in their daily routines as the medical community works to find better treatments uh, for these um, debilitating symptoms. The most meaningful part of this year for me personally um, has been supporting the recovery of healthcare workforce. Um, this is a nice you nurse from uh, outside of Los Angeles that was transferred to us from another hospital having gone months on ECMO um, versus uh, supporting his lung function, ventilator weaning, recovering from a stroke, um, work up for transplant, not needing a transplant and eventually sending him home off oxygen without a tracheostomy, walking. Um, when I called him to have permission to use these photos, he's preparing to return to work as a bedside nurse. He, was, he contracted COVID-19 working in the COVID ICU. Um, at his at his home hospital, and I got this uh, picture via text Christmas morning of his family. Um, so there were there were a lot of great um, Christmas morning family pictures from patients, particularly healthcare workforce members um, that we had taken care of and had helped return home to their families. So personally, I think that that's been a, a challenging part. In it's you're so connected. You're there's so many connections between you and your patients. Um, more than ever before, um, the way that you relate to your patients and realizing that they uh, contracted the virus at work. Um, but ultimately this year has, I've had such great support from my institution and um, have felt very safe with PPE and the support of our administrators and my clinical team. I um, just have been grateful to be able to go to work each day and contribute to people's recovery and um, feel like I'm making a difference. Um, within this larger pandemic. There are some references and I look forward to your questions and hearing from the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Jamie. And now I'd like to introduce Charlene Wu, who's a staff occupational therapist at NYU Langone Hospital at Bellevue Hospital Center. And thank you, Charlene, for sharing your experiences and perspectives. Thank you, uh, Mary. I'm just gonna hope that the sharing my screen situation works. <laughs> this computer has been a challenge to say the least. Well. Looks good. Okay, how does that look to everybody? I think it's okay, Charlene. Okay. <laughs> All okay. right. So uh, good morning slash almost afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlene and I'm an occupational therapist at Bellevue Hospital uh, and I work alongside um, both Rachel Flaherty and Ilan, whom I would like to thank for helping me uh, guide me and direct me with this presentation. Um, I also want to thank uh, AOTF for having me today um, and for all of you for joining us. Um, I find that this webinar series is going to be very helpful for us as occupational therapists looking forward um, to what OT can provide for, for patients after the pandemic. Uh, my presentation today will hopefully uh, shine a spotlight on the potential mental health crisis that may arise for both practitioners and patients post pandemic and the various ways that occupational therapists can assist patients with navigating these difficult times, mitigating the impact of stress and anxiety, um, helping to initiate discussions regarding mental health and the importance of managing your mental health, um, as well as uh, facilitating return to favorite occupations, uh, looking beyond just self-care um, and sort of the basic daily needs that people have to take care of in order to, to function in life. Um, my presentation will draw on case studies of two of the patients who were admitted to our inpatient rehab unit, um, as well as my own experience with being uh, COVID positive 
and the ways in which this diagnosis helped my uh, interactions with and treatment of these patients once I returned to work. Um, just a, I wanted to start today with a little background on my personal COVID course. I tested positive fairly early on in the pandemic, so towards the end of March, um, and had every symptom that you could have possibly had with COVID. I lost my sense of taste and smell, I had fever, shortness of breath, low oxygen levels, chills, body aches, um, and just very intense fatigue. Um, my average oxygen saturation, saturation levels were, were in the high 70s um, after a strenuous walk to the bathroom, which was right outside my bedroom door, um, to sort of a low 90s when I was resting in bed at the height of my COVID course, which was about two and a half weeks into or post-diagnosis. Um, the shortness of breath and the low oxygen levels followed me as I returned to work about five, we five weeks later um, and continued for the next few months. Um, the saturation levels were around 92 to 95 percent when I first returned to work, um, and they have kind of stabilized to about 98, 99 percent now. Um, my activity tolerance for activities beyond ADL, so including IADLs um, and some leisure activities, remained low for about four to four to five months after returning to work. Um, and my exercise tolerance is now about 90% of my pre-COVID tolerance, almost a full year after my diagnosis. Um, I still have some difficulty walking, talking, and getting enough breath while masked, particularly when we're outside um, traveling um, to and from work. But overall, I feel close to my pre-pandemic baseline, if not um, sort of where I was before. Um, okay. I still intermittently have difficulty with taking a full breath, um, particularly when I'm exercising or doing something um, particularly strenuous, uh, including sometimes if I'm doing a, a dependent or substantial assist transfer. Um, and I think in those situations, it's mostly just a function of being masked and having multiple masks on and such things, but that is also improving um, as the days go by. Okay, so the two patients that we are going to be discussing today have um, similar starts to their cases, but different endings. Uh, the patient A was admitted to our inpatient rehab unit um, and initially admitted to the hospital for a stroke. Um, she tested COVID positive after being transferred onto our rehab unit and was just discharged to a subacute rehab after two months. Her course was a little bit challenging because she um, did have a left-sided hemiparesis as a result of the stroke, as well as a left-sided uh, left neglect. Um, and she was also um, older than patient B. And so her fatigue levels and her activity tolerance were lower prior to her admission um, onto our rehab unit. Patient B was admitted to an outside hospital for COVID. Uh, he had a very complex hospital course that included, uh, he was vented, um, and proned and in a hospital for months before being transferred to our inpatient rehab unit. Um, but he was discharged home um, after two months with us with uh, family training and uh, medical equipment in the home. Both patients uh, were about a partial assist uh, for transfers uh, before they were at point of discharge. Um, but patient A required substantial to partial assist for ADLs, whereas patient B required, required partial assist for bathing, but was a setup supervision for, for all other ADLs. Um, although these patients had different outcomes and they seemed very different, there were common themes that emerged from their time on our unit and in our um, therapy sessions together, some of which ran very parallel to my own experiences. And I will have to say that having these patients had a, a weird sort of therapeutic effect for me as well, um, because I felt as though trying to figure out my own course um, in the midst of this new diagnosis was help, helped along by my um, opportunities to help these patients and helping them get back to their regular lives as well. So it kind of had a, a therapeutic effect for me as a therapist as well. Um, in terms of those COVID commonalities, so on an inpatient rehab unit, we did focus a lot on self-care um, and improving the patient's independence, decreasing the burden of care, and all of the things that you would uh, sort of normally 
attempt to um, address when a patient is on an inpatient rehab unit. The differences, I think, with the COVID patients were there were a lot, a higher amount of focus or emphasis on energy conservation and breathing techniques, um, simply because even the simple act of getting the set up, set up at the edge of the bed took a lot of effort, a lot of um, energy, and a lot of difficulty breathing um, as they tried to do something as simple as sitting up. Um, there were cognitive deficits that were noted in both patients, although the caveat to that is that patient A was um, admitted because of a stroke. So some of her cognitive deficits could have been a, as a function of her stroke. Um, but a common thing that um, patient, both patients would say was, I used to be able to do this before. So things like you know, focusing on a task, um, money management, being able to manipulate um, numbers in their head, didn't used to have any issues with that before, but we're now experiencing difficulties. And it was a big, um, it was a difficult thing to come to terms with. Um, they used to always say things that used to be easy or not hard, harder than they were and harder than they should be, which is also something that I had felt as well and was very discouraging because it didn't feel as though um, it should be this difficult, and yet it was. Um, and then the mental health struggles, I think, that I saw on a day-to-day -day basis, I think at the time of the pandemic or the height of the pandemic, everybody was in survival mode, whether it was patients in a hospital, people that were out in, in, in the world and living about um, out there, um, everybody was just trying to make it through. And I think that um, also created a lot of, um, it stopped our future thinking. And I think that future thinking is very important when we talk about um, coping strategies and uh, kind of our mental health uh, in general. Um, there were a lot of anxiety, sleeplessness, um, guilt and shame, uh, I think were, were also uh, prevalent for both myself as well as for these patients. Um, for the patients, it was more from a sense of now my family has to do all of these things for me um, and I feel bad about that. Was there something I could have done to have prevented this from happening? Um, is there anything that I can do now to make things better for myself and for my family? Um, and, you know, things like toileting and bathing are very intimate um, ADLs. And I think the fact that they both needed help with that at the end of their stay and upon discharge was a big source of shame for them. And uh, regardless of how many times they were encouraged by their family members or supported by their family members, I think it's still a very deep rooted um, and deep seated feeling. Uh, and then their coping strategies. I think um, one of the patients had uh, an alcohol dependence problem. Uh, and so we talked talked a lot about finding different ways to cope with a difficult situation. Um, but I think it was a little bit harder in this, situ in this time um, because there were so many things that were outside of their control. Um, the, the interesting thing for me um, at this point in particular was the things that I, that I deemed most important with patients with COVID had changed from what I had deemed the most important initially. So initially when I first started as a therapist and you think about occupational therapy, it's, you know, it's about function. It's about getting them to be independent and safe while they're doing their, their ADLs and you know, hopefully their ideal tasks, work tasks and leisure tasks. Um, but I think the more I kind of recovered from COVID and the more that these patients recovered from COVID, you know, things like what is the distance between the bedroom and the bathroom? What is the distance between the toilet and the tub? Um, you know, how much, how high is the bed? How low is the bed? How soft is the mattress? All of these things impacting a patient's ability to move their body in a way that conserves as much energy so that they have that in order, they have that energy storage um, to do the sort of the more leisurely family engaged things once they get discharged. But what I found was for the patient themselves, their, their most the thing that they wanted to focus on the most was their ADLs and being independent with them. And they just didn't feel as though it was important to talk about anything besides that. And again, going back to the whole survival mode. Um, as a therapist and as um, a person who um, was also struggling with engaging in sort of leisure activities and things like that, we wanna talk about self-care as more than just taking our physical care of ourselves. Uh, so we wanna, you know, if we think about occupations and purposeful activities, 
Um, every person has a different set of occupations and activities that they do, but it should also bring them personal satisfaction and fulfillment. Um, and it should be something that they enjoy doing. And hopefully with that enjoyment comes an ability to sort of cope more with their, um, with the challenges that lie ahead. While these patients were on our unit, neuropsychology attempted to follow them. However, they were not ready to discuss any um, emotional, psychological, or spiritual needs that they had at that moment um, because they were so focused on sort of just kind of making it through rehab and being able to take care of themselves. Um, both patients were used to be religious. They went to church religiously. They grew up in a religious family. Um, however, during their hospital stay, they um, declined to see a chaplain uh, and they kind of they rarely spoke about prayer or God or a higher being or spirituality in general. Uh, and then something else to keep in mind for, for the caregivers, particularly for the patient that uh, went home, uh, we talked a lot about caregiver burden and the mental health and the emotional spiritual health of the caregivers as well and ensuring that those roles um, kind of stayed compartmentalized as much as they could be in order to facilitate sort of a husband and wife relationship versus a caregiver um, patient relationship. Um, Okay. So moving on to the clinician uh, burnout aspect of it. So uh, as Pamela had mentioned in the presentation, the clinician burnout is a thing. It's something that has been around and is getting worse and it's not something that is going to get better unless we do something to address it. I think a couple of the things, particularly just for me, um, I think the, the because it was so early on in the pandemic and information was changing daily, uh, I didn't know what to think or how to feel or how, you know, I was going to manage things. When I was sick, I didn't want to go to a hospital, even though there were a couple times where I probably should have, um, because, you know, I didn't know, I didn't want to take up a bed that could have gone to somebody else. I had all of these feelings of sort of, feel, uh, of guilt in that, you know, because I didn't have to be hospitalized, maybe I wasn't as sick as I thought I was, um, you know, it, I think that there's a lot of this um, anxiety that is stemming from the unknown, just not knowing what was going to happen or what was going to change and what the best thing to do was. I also think that social media plays a big role, particularly in the pandemic. There were a couple of studies out of China that indicated for the general population, social media actually was a beneficial factor in the sense that it gave people this um, sense of, of social togetherness um, that kind of mitigated from the social isolation that they felt as a result of the pandemic for, you know, due to quarantine and, and such things. But sometimes I feel as though for medical professionals, it might have had the opposite effect, simply because, you know, you go on social media and you see the news and you hear people who, um, you know, not knowing what was happening with the pandemic, saying things like it's just like another flu, um, it's not that big of a deal. People aren't really dying from it. It doesn't really matter. Why are we doing this? So there was a lot of people that kind of fell on, on each side of the, the spectrum. And I think as a, as a medical professional, it, it kind of burdened my heart a lot um, because I had a lot of friends and family that were, you know, sort of pro-economy, I think would be the best way to put that. Um, but without sort of understanding that there there were things that were happening in the hospital that, um, that, that they couldn't understand because they weren't in it. Um, and then on top of all of that, there was already sort of non-COVID related burnout that was already happy, happening with therapists. And um, you know it kind of exacerbated all of those issues. So finally, in terms of um, where we can go with this. So I was actually very curious about the similarities between COVID and sort of the HIV AIDS crisis during the 1980s. I have an acquaintance that was a nurse in New York City in the 1980s at the height of the AIDS crisis. And we had a very interesting discussion about how similar they were in terms of, you know, it was a new um, virus that nobody knew anything about. It, you know, only impacted certain people, not everybody. So why should we care? Um, you know, nobody knew how it was spread. So, you know, there were kind of conspiracy theories about everything and sort of the social isolation that people felt as a result of it. And I think for myself, 
you know, do I relay my status? Like, hey, I'm, you know, COVID positive, but I'm not contagious, but I didn't know if I was contagious or not. So these are all sorts of the things that I kind of struggled with in my own mind, um, and then leading to even further isolation in that. Um, the, so Jamie's presentation was actually quite um, interesting because I also wondered about the differences between hospitalized and non-hospitalized COVID patients in terms of their mental health as well. Um, because you know the idea is that if you were hospitalized then you must have really had it badly, but if you weren't hospitalized, then you were fine and there was no in-between. Um, and my own medical doctor's response to kind of my concerns was, um, as long as you can take a shower and get dressed, you're fine. Um, and for me, I was an athlete in college. <laughs> like I, I want to be able to do all the things I did before, but I couldn't because I was still having breathing issues and activity tolerance issues and things like that. So I think that'll be interesting. Um, and then also just looking at uh, return to function uh, beyond self-care for, for all of these patients. But I have to say that this was the being able to treat a patient with a diagnosis that I had myself was a, a, an enlightening time for me. And it was very different than usual because I you know, never had a stroke or I've never had a brain injury. So um, it was a learning experience for me, um, but I appreciate it and will take this experience with me going forward. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Charlene, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, we have a few minutes for some discussion and some questions, and um, we have some that have already been provided. Feel free to add more if you'd like. Um, those of you who are on the panel, thank you. I can see you popping back up on video. Thank you. Um, Charlene, if you could stop sharing, that'll enable, I think, people to see the panel a little clearer. So if we can just jump right right into questions. The first one is, I'm interested in the distress, including moral distress, that you all at Bellevue experienced and if and how you addressed it. And I think if the panel can unmute. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I mean, I think that we, we have a lot of feelings about, about in, in separate categories. categories. So we, so we had a lot of feelings about, about you know, what, what we were doing, doing with our patients, patients and making sure we were giving them and providing them the best care to the best of our knowledge and trying to um, make sure that we weren't doing any harm and, and, and things such as that. However, it was a difficult time in which to do it because we were in the middle of a pandemic that was also very polarizing. So I think for us, we just tried to be as honest as possible with each other, along with as honest as possible as we could be just being transparent with our patients and just letting them know that we are doing the best that we can with the information that we had at the time. And then we just have to be flexible and adapt to um, what the, the changing times were bringing us and, and you know, hoping that um, in our transparency that we would be doing the best thing that we could for, for our patients and for ourselves as well. Thanks. Rachel, did you want to comment as well? Sure. Um, I think we had kind of two modes of how we tried to battle some of this um, experience. Uh, one would be kind of the hospital system level things. So we had rest and recharge rooms. We had availability of our employee assistant programs for people who were experiencing distress. Um, we also, within our own department, tried to have a lot of um, protected time to kind of storytell, to download. Um, and it wasn't just like, it's the end of the day when I'm writing my notes, it's a protected time for everyone in a safe space to discuss. I think the regularity of that had really helped with the staff because there was a time that everybody knew that I could come here and I'll be able to say, oh, I saw this on this floor and I thought we were going to tell this. We're kind of like debunking a lot of myths and uh, rumors that were going on so that everybody could be on the same page. And I think that, and I had mentioned about the uh, crisis communication. I'm very interested in that because now that we're kind of slowing down, how are people feeling? Were we really as good as we thought we were? Um, were, were we feeling, um, were we as supportive as, as supervisors as we needed to be? So I think that is a future direction we could look into as well. Thanks. Um, this next one's for Pam. 
With increased vaccinations of both staff and family, do you expect, expect stress and anxiety of workers to be reduced? It actually isn't. Actually, I think it's getting um, worse because they, they, there's still the unknown. And part of um, the literature, and I apologize for my dogs in the background. Um, part of the literature is showing that we're gonna be seeing this for two to three years and we don't wanna take our finger off the pulse. And that's why we decided to go ahead and start the Battle Buddy program because I had worked with some physician groups that we had started early on. But I think that we're starting to see um, the long haulers that have many, many problems and we have to get them back into some type of function and the problems are, are wide ranging. So I think it's actually, um, here to stay for a while and I don't want to lose the finger on the pulse and that's part of why we're really trying to take an active role in it now so I don't think the vaccines are actually making that much difference and actually people are now speaking up more. Okay thanks. There's a second question about the Battle Buddy program. Um, is it led by OT or is it an interprofessional effort and is it possible to share the link to the protocol? Sure I can put the I can look up the um, Link and put it in the chat, and it is. I'm 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 leading it in conjunction with a neuropsychologist, but it's going to be interprofessional. But we will be looking at uh, differences by professions. Thanks. I think the next one's actually for Jamie, asking what was involved in the functional activity desaturation assessment. So we're finding that patients requiring supplemental oxygen because their saturations fall. Uh, below a 90% normal level, um, it often falls very dramatically when you start to ask them to move. Um, and sometimes they're symptomatic, sometimes they're not. So it's titrating oxygen really demands activity assessment and it's not just walking and they're stuck in their rooms. It's not just the standard DSAT study that would be walking, which RT does, which is just walking for a set amount of minutes and starting at room air and you slowly turn up the oxygen until you get their, their saturation to 90%. It's basically, um, I put a pulse oximeter on their finger and I have a prescription from a physician saying titrate oxygen to maintain a range between 88 to 92% or 90 to 95%. And it's a mix, it's a, it's a blend of giving them the oxygen they need to support to maintain that range while also modifying the way in which you perform an activity, sitting versus standing, um, the duration of rest breaks. And then the third component, which is a person's behavior, which I think is the most important part of why we need to be doing these in this situation more than other providers is, you know if a patient's an athlete and they're gonna push themselves and they're gonna do, no, do it no matter what. And you know if a person is going to get, knock it off the couch after you've spent a few weeks with them. And so knowing a person's behavior and personality, knowing what their goals are, uh, knowing how compliant they tend to be, and then under coaching them and giving them a prescription for how they're going to perform a sequence of tasks or even just the basics of a simple movement task, um, pairing that with, am I gonna give, am I gonna err on the side of caution and give them a little bit more oxygen? Am I gonna give them a little bit of less oxygen? and then te um, helps them guide, okay, you're gonna go home on four liters to sleep and six liters once you get up to move around in the day. A lot of times we're the person, we're the provider holding discharge because their saturations are still dropping to levels that wouldn't be safe for home. And this is something that I have done a lot of the past years working with pulmonary fibrosis and in lung transplant. Um, so it was, it was a modified type study um, measuring the, uh, you're also documenting insurance criteria. So you've got to demonstrate the desaturate to qualify for, uh, to qualify for oxygen. When I'm on telehealth, I have them do a sit to stand. So I use a one minute sit to stand assessment. I ask them to self pace to maintain a breathlessness rating of six out of 10 with their own pulse oximeter on their finger. And then we um, see how severe their desaturation is. Um, and I give them a week worth of guidance on where to set their levels. Um, and we follow up the following week until they're on room air. Thank you. There's a few questions about treating long haulers. Wondering if, if any of you have been treating long haulers and also asking more generally how OTs can support this group. And finally asking if long haulers are actually seeking OT services. 
The long haulers we've been working with at USC, uh, we actually get quite a few referrals from primary care physicians, as well as uh, from our COVID recovery clinic, which is a specialty care clinic. So, you know, there's a lot of frustration with these patients that are going to their general provider and the providers don't know what to do. So they are referring to these specialty clinics at larger facilities and we get OT referrals through them. We're helping them depending on what their symptomatic complaints are, managing, I, I, I can compare it to how you would work with someone with a, a chronic rheumatological autoimmune type condition maybe. Um, there's a lot of editorials being published that patients don't want to just be sent to cognitive behavioral therapy, which we obviously what we do is a little bit more, more diverse than that, but they don't want just talk therapy. They want solutions, they want interventions, they want, they want medications, but while we figure out what's happening and how to help people through that and the interventions, med medical therapies that will work, I think it's the supportive therapy of how do you find balance in your day? How do you, when you have attention problems and when you've got this severe mental fatigue, the one thing patients tell me that I want my, my providers to know how tired I am. I cannot get through an email without making typos and repeating myself. And I, have, I, I don't trust myself to send emails without making mistakes. I don't trust myself to drive to wherever I'm driving and not forget where I'm going along the way. Teaching them how to build in supports, uh, those metacognitive training strategies we can use to help. Um, they, they can tell me what's wrong with their cognitive attention. They can tell me what's wrong with their concentration. They're generally very high functioning people that are trying to work remotely from home and manage their lives and are just as burnt out as everyone else is right now. But they have this really pervasive fatigue in addition to these other just wide array of symptoms. And so helping them to understand their symptoms, put words to their symptoms, understand the trends and how activity and exercise influences those symptoms and the um, exacerbations of them. And then helping them to find balance in, in pacing themselves, in um, finding restorative moments in the day and um, compensating while we wait for you know, tracking to see how things improve at this time is what we're working on. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions about OT students. One wants to know if any of you worked with OT students through the pandemic and if it affected their interactions with patients. And then a second question about students who've had COVID and maybe experiencing some brain fog symptoms kind of accommodations that can support them? So over at Bellevue, yes, we did have uh, students during the pandemic. We didn't have it at the height of the pandemic. We stopped our um, student program for both level one and level twos. But sort of later in the summer, um, about uh, June, July, when things started to slow down a bit, um, they were treating COVID patients. They were um, acting as just as we were. So they also got the experience of treating this patient population without um, major change to what our normal student program would be. We also had, sorry, go ahead, Pam. Okay, we also had um, students, um, again, during the height of the pandemic, we paused no, for a short now. while. Um, we just postponed theirs and so that we could figure out exactly how to make sure the experiences were helpful. But what was really interesting, and I'll just um, talk about in the outpatient with the video visits, it was interesting because the students learned new skills. They had to learn how to do safety assessments um, through video. And we actually, the students had to call 911 twice. And we actually saved two people's lives. So it's different skills. Um, but I think it was a great experience and it really taught us how to better um, think about what are the criteria and what do we need to do when we first get on a video or telehealth with a patient. So I think it was a great experience for the students. Yeah, thank you. I'm conscious of the time because I know we promised to wrap up by 9.30. Jamie, did you want to say more about that? Uh, it was just about this. We did a remote student model for our, um, so uh, until we could bring them back on site. And I think it's just that reflecting back one year ago when our res my resident that I was, I had an OTD resident who was at, at home and was participating virtually as she was able to um, and seeing some patients on telehealth. And now this year I've been cleared and my resident has asked to come to COVID with me and 
Um, it's just been such a dramatic change having someone barely there virtually on Zoom to join my telehealth sessions to now being in the room and learning to care for these patients and, and wanting to be and being allowed to bring them in when they weren't allowed on campus or in the building for the first few months. It's just, we've come a long way with students and I'm, I'm so happy that they've been open-minded and um, that we get the opportunity to train them because it's better to have them with me now than have them out there in the world in a few, in a few months on their own learning for themselves, so. Thank you. Um, I know we didn't get to all the questions. I know there's been some additional um, exchanges in the chat. So hopefully that's been helpful with um, the panelists. Um, in wrapping up, I did want to give each of the panelists a chance if they had any either concluding comments or anything they wanted to say to each other, because I didn't give you that opportunity yet in terms of you sharing this panel time. Um, is there anyone that does have any, any comments or things that you'd like to, to say in closing? I think that for all of us have um, experienced and been part of um, the journey of looking at COVID patients. And I think it's, there's definitely a role for OT. And I think has been mentioned is there's research that has to be done from an OT perspective and we need to get it out there. Thanks, Pam. Anyone else? I have to say one thing I think that's come out of COVID that I think is so great is the way that we're formatting occupational therapy education and collaboration. Um, I think across the country, I've never been more in, involved with other OTs at other academic centers and other uh, hospital affiliated sites, um, collaborating and, and spending time together, just brainstorming and writing and, and coming up with uh, shared programming and ideas. And I think it's great. I think these panels are a really great way to connect clinicians and connect groups. Um, it might be a nice way to move back into in-person conferences once we once we move that way on shared topics. And um, I think it's a great way to share information. So I really appreciate you putting this together, Mary and the OTF. Thank you. I had mentioned this before, but um, in, in the spirit of connecting with other folks across the country, the AOTA webinar series, the COVID-19 Jamie, your group at USC had really played a huge role in our development of our protocol. And it was nice to see that we were on the right track and now being on the same stage as you guys is, is, is wonderful. So this is a great collaboration. Thank you. Charlene, did you want to say anything? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for um, inviting me onto this panel. I learned a lot and I loved that everybody's presentation, uh, I feel like we were all kind of on the same page in terms of where we are gonna be headed and in which direction we're going. Um, Jamie, I'm very interested uh, to hear more about your work with the long haulers because uh, just from a very selfish personal perspective, but um, I will say that I think we had, there was a question in the chat about anything positive that came out of it. And I think one of the things is more of this collaborative spirit in terms of, you know, healthcare workers coming together and supporting each other um, and really trying to do the best that we can for our patients, because at the end of the day, that's who it's about. And that's why we do what we do. And um, I think it kind of reinvigorates our need and our sense of, of doing the best work that we can for um, patients with this very new and sometimes scary diagnosis. So I look forward to see what the future holds. Thank you. And that's probably a good place to um, wrap up the discussion, but thank you to all of you. I know um, a lot of you put a lot of effort into thinking about what to share with the group today. And we really, we really appreciate it. I hope you've had a chance to see in the chat, the appreciation that many of the attendees are expressing to all of you for what you've shared today. So I hope you have a chance to look at that. I want to just pop up on the screen before we say goodbye. Um, the um, upcoming events that the AOTF is sponsoring um, in connection with the um, AOTA conference. And you can get more information on these events as well on the website, but we hope you'll be able to join us. We are planning a third part of this series, looking again at um, research opportunities for the research community to pursue some of the ideas that were both generated today and at the first webinar. So we hope you will all return to that session as well. But it's, it's a little hard, I think, to convey um, 
appreciation because we don't exactly have good vehicles on Zoom to clap, but I think I can speak from the audience and, and thank you all again for your contributions. Take care everyone and have a good day.